it's quite obvious that uh, thousands of you who had the uh, opportunity that I shared with you to interact uh, with my guest, uh, Professor Janet Schwalebach, um, I love her last name, uh, as I said before, uh, who started a 30 minutes discourse on uh, one of the most perennial themes of our time, uh, the question of justice. Uh, I was so thrilled and um, challenged uh, by what she had to say uh, about justice uh, that I thought that this particular episode of African Ascent, in fact, uh, should be devoted to Travan Martin and uh, Michael Brown, um, who died um, at a very young age on broad daylight as victims of uh, injustice. So uh, what I thought um, African Ascent uh, would do, and uh, Professor Schwalebog um, agrees, in fact, it was she who, towards the end of that particular interview, um, who told me when I asked her, uh, what would you like to talk about uh, when you come back again? And she firmly and um, uh, courageously said, justice. And that is exactly what we're going to do. It's going to be on justice. Welcome to African Ascent um, uh, for the second time. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the viewers uh, who saw you for the first time in African Ascent um, collectively commented um, how great you are um, in the interaction that you've developed with the camera. Uh, you look at it, uh, you speak to it, uh, you treat it um, uh, as a human being. And the beneficiaries, of course, are these uh, thousands of viewers um, who are learning from us, uh, some of whom are planning to come and uh, participate in visual landscapes in the future. Uh, so uh, on the behalf of Afghan Ascent, I want to begin for uh, being a stellar guest. So uh, we'll repeat that uh, stellarness, uh, should we say, uh, again. So um, uh, I know that you're not only a professor of literature, but you're also a philosopher like me, uh, a professionally trained philosopher, in fact. So uh, I think it's appropriate for us uh, uh, to speak about justice philosophically first. So uh, what is justice? What does it mean to you? Well, first I want to thank you for having me back and for continuing our conversation I too was challenged by the conversation and appreciate the opportunity to talk about such an important issue. I think it is rare for there to be a public forum where we can talk about what matters most to us. And for me, justice is one of the things that matters most to who we are as human beings. It speaks to our essential integrity, our essential freedom, and our subjectivity, our right to feel and act as we feel and as we act in an ethical way with others. So when I think of justice, I think first, having come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition myself, I think of the Bible verse let justice roll down like waters, like water and truth an everlasting stream. And so justice for me first and foremost is nourishing. It is what keeps our souls alive and healthy. It is required for human life and thriving. It also speaks to our yearning for justice mm. that we as people since the beginning of our existence have struggled against oppression. I see. And so this struggling for justice is an ongoing historical and future endeavor. It is not something which is ever done. I am never finished learning. I am never finished contributing. And then I think of, again, my training in the Judeo-Christian tradition of uh, St. Augustine mm -hmm. and Thomas Aquinas, who define justice as that which falls 
not within the laws of man, but within the laws of the divine. What does the divine ask of us? How can we transcend the minimal that we ask from each other and offer the best and the most that we can? So those are my initial associations. I think first of the Hebrew Bible and the Israelite struggle for justice, how uh, the Israelite God describes justice to them, and then to the early philosophers in the Western tradition who describe justice as interrelated and necessarily connected with the divine. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable. And there are so many ways by which we could um, slice this out uh, even more. So uh, let me begin with this first. I also know that you're interested um, in what we talked about uh, last week, um, power knowledge. What might the relationship be between power slash knowledge and justice in your mind, if there is any relationship? I think there is a very strong relationship between Foucault's idea of power knowledge and the active work of justice. Foucault himself, when he was developing his ideas of power knowledge, was very active politically mm -hmm. on behalf of civil rights for um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, at that, uh, at that time gay, lesbian, bisexual mm -hmm. um, uh, citizens of France, uh, where he was a citizen. And he was very involved internationally with the political movement to raise awareness and visibility for gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. And his initial work uh, started with an examination of the prison system in France. So in Discipline and Punish, he conducts a kind of history. He calls it an archaeology of ideas. How is it that in the West, we have conceived of punishment. How have we defined crime? And if we look at how punishment has changed over the centuries, we see that our definition of crime has changed. Our definition of justice has changed. Indeed, our definition of what it means to be human has changed. And his following work, in which he examined uh, the history of sexuality and points to the medical invention of the homosexual. So prior to 1850, we had uh, people who engaged in uh, different kinds of sexual acts with different people. There was no identity. Toward the beginning, of the uh, 17th century in uh, medical schools, there was one particular doctor looking to uh, produce his own body of knowledge to establish himself within the community. And so he started studying these sexual acts and he produced the identity of the homosexual. And for the first time, we see that word used as a noun and we see it used as part of our identity. Now, over 150 years later, when we imagine ourselves as people, we are often asked to imagine our sexualities, mm -hmm. to define ourselves in relationship to whom we would have sexual relations with. Historically, this has never been part of human identity. The experience has, the desire has, but being forced to identify oneself sexually being forced to identify as a race, being forced to identify as if we were sections of a person mm -hmm. instead of a full person, this had not occurred. And so Foucault's idea of power knowledge is to look at how historically 
our ideas about what it means to be human now create our own assumptions about ourselves. He said in the book Power Knowledge, mm -hmm. everything I have written is a fiction. Hmm. Fascinating. Very much so. A philosopher and a historian. Everything I have written is a fiction. fiction. Meaning, all of it is socially constructed. I see. The stories we tell about ourselves are the most important stories we have. Remarkable. Now, I'm going to return to this um, intricate connection that uh, you just began um, elaborating on uh, between power, uh, knowledge, and justice momentarily. Now, let me take you back to Plato, for example. Yes. Uh, for Plato, as you know, mm, justice is uh, something mm, that can be constructed by a particular human being who makes deliberate decisions to work on his or her soul. The assumption that Plato makes is that there is something called soul, which analytically speaking is not observable. And if we subject it to verificationism, as the positivists demand it, then strictly speaking, there isn't what we can call soul because we can't verify its existence. Plato makes the further assumption that what makes the soul particular is that it is something that exists but which cannot be observed. Now, the human being then who would like to be just would have to assume that he or she has a soul. And moreover, for Plato, once you assume that you have a soul, then you have the further duty to also be intimately aware of the parts of the soul, which Plato elegantly called the part that reasons, the part that desires, and the part that acts ending that the person who is attempting to be just has to pay meticulous attention to the internal workings of reason, desire, and action by ultimately submitting to reason, to govern desire and action. Or to put it differently, one acts or must act only and only after one allows reason to control the flows of desire so that the action could be balanced and, significantly speaking, correct. There is this view of justice then. Yes. Now, as you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the later Foucault mm. uh, decides to turn his gaze away from the medicalization of the self to the ethics of the self. And then he looks back, he goes back to read the, stories, the Stoics, uh, Plato himself, um, Aristotle, uh, the great Roman thinkers, including mm -hmm. Epictetus, so forth mm -hmm. and so on, and then develops this remarkable idea of justice being something that occurs when we take care of the self, which is a roundabout way of returning to Plato, I think. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Now, when I go around uh, in my everyday life and uh, look at people, including myself, unless we reprogram mm. <laughs> our school systems, mm. with the exception of you and I and uh, a few academics who are mm. privy to this literature, mm. most human beings who may be yearning, and, uh, as you correctly mm. argued, for justice, do not even know mm. how to begin to be just. Mm. They are lost. Mm. So, how can we help them? 
Yes. First. I apologize for this long, I, no, I <laughs> elaborate. This is, <laughs> this is very helpful because one of the challenges in contemporary discourse in the United States is to talk about justice without confining it to religion yes. or confining it to the criminal justice criminal justice system. Correct. How do we do that? How do we imagine a justice which is larger than that? This is a place where I think feminist and womanist scholarship Correct. has brought particular insight that part of our, the legacy of Plato and that we find throughout Western philosophy is the division between the mind and the body, reason and emotion. Reason is what we trust. Yes. The mind is what we trust. The body is what we cannot trust. The emotion is what we cannot trust. And yet, to imagine justice without empathy, without compassion, I cannot do it. You're quite right. That to be nourished as justice requires means to be treated as a full human being in my body with my emotions. So we might look at the conversation we're having today and we start with naming the murders of Trayvon Martin. Correct and of Michael Brown. We also need to name the murder of Renisha McBride, a young African-American woman murdered in Detroit by a white man claiming self-defense. Very similar circumstances to the murder of Trayvon Martin. Yet where is the news coverage? Where is the outrage? Where are the protests? Mm -hmm. That this young black woman's life is as valuable as any other life. But because she is a black woman, we do not have protests in the street. We do not see her on the front page when we open up our computer. Here is a place where the work of women in the world and the work of womanist and feminist scholars reminds us that to denigrate our emotions, empathy, compassion, our instincts which unite our body and our mind is to fall short of justice. It is also the work of womanist and feminist theologians who first postulated that it is the care of the self where ethics begins. Correct. That it is in the neglect of the self which renders it impossible for us to care for another. We cannot give what we do not have. And so the overcoming this legacy, an academic, intellectual legacy, which divides us from ourselves. Yes. I think we can trust our children to enter this world as full humans, as we discussed in our last interview with Franz Fanon, that he did not need to be taught as a child what was just, he knew. And when he was treated unjustly, he knew. We teach our children to live with injustice. We teach our white children to ignore injustice, to not see it, to not respond to it. And we teach African American children to the very best of our ability how to survive the grave injustices in the United States. Our school systems are another situation, but I believe very strongly, and I think 
uh, have been transformed myself by the work of Bell Hooks, of Alice Walker, of, her name just left my mind, Angela Davis, of yes, course. Of course. No one needed to explain justice to Angela Davis. Correct. And I think it is the danger for us in our schooling that we teach away from justice instead of toward justice. justice. Does that make sense to Absolutely. you? Absolutely. In fact, um, I have to phrase what I'm uh, about to ask you very carefully, as carefully as I can. On my way here, as I was uh, thinking of how to interview you, I was listening to NPR in the context of the discussions that are mm. taking place within Congress about pushing the president, who is already inclined in that direction, perhaps not because he chooses so, but because he has to be presidential. And then it suddenly occurred to me, and this is where the phrasing has to be done correctly, because I don't want my viewers to misunderstand me. I was invariably led to compare perhaps apples and oranges, but compare them nevertheless. Compare what the beheadings of two Americans is leading the country to consider doing versus the death of Trevor Martin yes. and Michael Brown, which, as you correctly point out, did not even result in massive social movement, although it should. Yes. Because this is about the death of human beings. Yes who are as valuable or perhaps less valuable as all human beings are since our destiny is to die. Mm. Mm, although when we are in the helms of power, we behave as if we can even conquer death. And I and you know that we're born only because we are fated to die. Yes. But these kinds of profound connections are rarely made in the minds of ordinary individuals. And then the news media doesn't help matters much when it glamorizes the possibility of going to war because two human beings have become beheaded. And then it makes decisions to pay lip service or two or three minutes attention to the deaths of two children yes. whose parents will remain heartbroken for the rest of their lives. Now, let's go back now to um, power knowledge and justice. Yes. And apply that matrix to these apples and oranges that I have tried to compare. Yes. I think you are right to point out that they are of the same nature, that the beheading of two Americans by a terrorist organization abroad is horrifying, is terrifying, and was done for spectacle, to show over and over again yeah. in the minds of the viewer. The death of Trayvon Martin and the death, the murder of Michael Brown specifically is of the same nature. Yes. It is terrifying, it is horrifying, and it was produced as spectacle. His body laid in the street for four hours. No one was allowed to approach it. No medical assistance was called. The police put the yellow tape around it and 
waited four hours for the community to gather and to see this lifeless body. I really learned very much from Dr. Jelani Cobb in his article in The New Yorker where he talks about how this moment of spectacle is reminiscent of the moment of spectacle that lynching plays in the history of the United States. That it is not simply one body. That body is made visible as a warning and a message, this could be your body. The beheadings, this could be your body. So I think very much that we are talking in both instances about terrorism. Okay. Amiri Baraka, following the 9-11, September 11, 2001 bombings, wrote a poem, Somebody Blew Up America. At the time, he was the poet laureate of New Jersey. He was Professor Emeritus and had numerous honorary doctorates. In this poem, Somebody Blew Up America, which I encourage you to read, Amiri Baraka compares terrorism from abroad to the terrorism that has been endured by African American people in United States history, in, a, in contemporary life, to the terrorism exercised against Jews in the United States, against uh, Japanese people during World War II and the internment camps that we had here in the United States. And he asks, who? Who decides what terrorism is? Whose life matters? And as a result of asking that question, of bringing, of making visible domestic terrorism and connecting it to international terrorism, he lost his position as a poet laureate of New Jersey. He was removed from his teaching post nice. and he received death threats. This is one of our most accomplished playwrights, activists, poets, writers of the 20th century. He helped to start the black arts movement in the 1950s. He transformed with other artists our nation. And when he dares to speak the truth, to even ask, he is silenced. So what does this have to do with Foucault, with power knowledge? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Whose lives matter? Foucault does not do this work, but we can easily imagine a Foucauldian understanding of race in which race is produced as a, set, a socially constructed part of our identity that we are required to inhabit yes. and that we are and that affords us risks or advantages and privileges and which causes our lives to be valued differently. So the beheading of Americans sold of I'm sorry of, Amer of Americans abroad brings out feelings of nationalism. Correct. The murder of African American boys and girls, Renisha McBride, for example, or uh, other, I think, uh, prominent black uh, feminist thinkers have been pointing out it is not just black men that are the targets, it is black women, it is uh, uh, black uh, trans people that in fact uh, trans people of color have the highest risk of uh, police violence, of criminalization, of imprisonment, and of murder. 
they are in the most dangerous position simply because of their identity. Correct. And so how would Foucault understand? Of course, separating, labeling the violence abroad as terrorism mm. legitimizes a violent response. Labeling the murder of Michael Brown yeah. as terrorism yes. would, like, would also legitimate a violent response. Correct. Which the power structure is not willing to do. Precisely. The police, the mayor, the city council, the governor, all the way up. We are not, we are not willing to make reparations to African Americans in this country. As you put it um, brilliantly last week, there are two kinds of discourses which produce truth. One kind of discourse is explicitly normalized. Yes. Acknowledged, and we insinuate it into our linguistic idioms and our very existence. Should we forget to do that, the news media is always ready to remind us yes. that this particular discourse has to be acknowledged, and in that we are surreptitiously encouraged to own it. Yes. to make it our own in yes. the form of new truth. Whereas the other kind of truth, mm. you put it last week, is unacknowledged. Yes. In fact, the prospects of it becoming acknowledged by common sense terrorizes the music industry. And it will have to intervene very early on to see to it that common sense does not gravitate toward embracing this new discourse as truth in its own right. Yes. It is minimized, it is ridiculed, it is silenced, and in the case of uh, Baraka, it is rejected and fired from its position. Yes. Yes, that it is absurd that President Obama would be pursued with impeachment charges <laughs> yes. for literally doing his job. job. It is absurd. And it is only, I believe, because he is an African American man exercising power without apology that he is being pursued as such. That is his crime. It, astonishing. It is astonishing. And, and um, in fact, you're even more right. Let me share with you something mm. stunning that happened um, to me in, um, uh, in a sauna at the club to which I go. This was about two weeks ago. All of a sudden, we began talking about the Skip Gates drama that took place in Harvard. A very young man, I would say in his early 30s, this is in a sauna room, became heated and angry because he told me that the president behaved unpresidentially by calling the Cambridge police stupid. Of course, I had to correct him. I did say to him, in fact, he did not call the police mm. stupid. He said very carefully, they acted stupidly, which analytically means that had they behaved differently, he would have just as vigorously said they acted prudently. He separated the permanence of designations from the understandings of actions. He wasn't going to listen to it. He told me, no, this president is a racist. Mm, mm. This is where ordinary discourse is at. Yes, yes. My task and your task as educators mm. is phenomenal. How are we going to educate this population, Janet? 
What do we, we start to, to make them think about justice? I begin by asking them to be willing to unlearn what they know. I suggest that confusion is a sign of learning. I like that. When we have encountered the edge of our own certainty, our own knowledge, only then do we have the opportunity to learn. And so many young people have had creativity educated out of them. So many young people going to school in the United States are being educated for the test, for the answer, instead of learning to ask questions. It is the life of a philosopher to ask, what is the good life? We have been asking that question for centuries, and we continue to ask it. Our children want to ask that question. They look at their parents and their teachers and their colleagues. What is the good life? Is it the clothes that I wear? Is it how cool I talk? Is it the music I listen to? Is it financial wealth? Is it the exercise of compassion? Is it found in friendship? Is it found in love, loyalty, see. compassion? So for me, I start by asking students to describe their educational experience. Has it been competitive? Is there always one person on top? What does it mean if the way things are being taught or what is being taught does not interest you? How are you brought into the conversation? Or are you simply rejected? I think Foucault makes a very important and interesting observation in Discipline and Punish when he's talking about the physical construction of the prison, the panopticon, and he notes that it is in fact the blueprint for French schools. Mm. The prison is the blueprint for French mm. schools. schools. It is in the United States as well. Exactly. We train our students' bodies to sit still for eight hours a day. And when they do not, we medicate them. Absolutely. <laughs> we train our students' bodies to have biological functions three times a day when it is approved. This is wholly unnatural. Why would we do this? so they can become disciplined bodies that will sit when they are told to sit, that will naturally repre repress their own instincts and desires, either in prison, as a secretary, vastly different, of course, but to be a capitalist, That's right. to do work that is not physical and that is not connected to their bodies. And so asking my students, how have you been taught? And then asking them, what can you recall a moment you learned something? I see. And for our students, musicians, I might say, can you remember a moment when you were playing a piece and you suddenly got stuck. You thought you knew the piece, but you got stuck. You couldn't play through the whole piece. You didn't know it. And so you practiced that section over and over and you knew it. You learned it. Can you think of a moment when that has occurred? What were the conditions? And how do we reproduce those conditions within this classroom? So that this becomes about the production of new knowledge rather than the passive 
assumption of old knowledge. Does In, that make sense? Absolutely. Now, if you recall, um, when we talked about the possibility of having this interview, mm. one of the questions that I informally aimed at you uh, was pedagogy, mm. methods of teaching. And then both of us discovered that we shared a similar passion about teaching, namely that we ask questions. Teaching, then I and you agreed in that informal conversation, is less about teaching others how they must think and more about creating an environment in which they will think about what they should learn and how they should learn. You put it quite elegantly, it is about creating an environment in which inquiries in the form of discourses take place. So I want to celebrate you as a teacher and perhaps this interview I think should end by us talking more about teaching. Yes. Well, and this is, in fact, the first week of the semester at Berkeley. So teaching is very much on my mind. I have just come from classes. Yes. And I am always just somewhat stunned by the responsibility that I have as a teacher and deeply humbled that the people who sit in my class have granted me that authority. They assume I know what I'm talking about. I hope it's a safe assumption. <laughs> Nonetheless, it is an honor they bestow on me. Like you, my teaching is about questioning. In addition to Foucault, a, another strong influence on my thinking has been Sigmund Freud. Of course. The hermeneutics of suspicion. I see. How we know what we know. Through doubt, through skepticism, by asking questions. I think of the wonderful bell hooks, the questions she asks the way she asks them, and her commitment to creating an environment in which every student is learning toward freedom. Absolutely. That their experience is an experience of freedom made manifest. Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which influenced Bell Hooks very much, has influenced me. Bell Hooks, in her many books on uh, pedagogy, uh, has had a significant impact on me. It's important for me, if we are going to produce free freedom within our classrooms, we have to start with justice. There has to be space for every voice, for every experience. The assumptions and ignorance that I may enter a room with as a white American, need to be confronted before I walk through that door. That's right. And every student, the knowledge they bring to that class is recognized and legitimized. Correct. And from there, well, we can explore the world. And we <laughs> we do. can ask the big questions. The big question. Together. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Mm. It, it not only does it answer it, um, it has even enlightened me more. Mm. Only because I asked. <laughs> See? Um, you're quite right. Additionally, uh, what I do, Janet, is the first thing that I do is memorize their names. Yes. In five minutes, mm. I know them. And then once I know their names, I begin to befriend them. Mm. 
And once I begin befriending them, then this unnecessary tension that oppressive authority creates in the form of barriers between me and them, in my case, a dark-skinned philosopher, an accented, dark-skinned philosopher, strange-looking, who enunciates his words, all this begin to melt. Mm. In the process of humanizing myself, I humanize them, and yes. vice versa. Yes. A month and a half later, trust me on this, Janet, I've never talked about this in, uh, in our meetings, because my colleagues might not even believe it. I begin sensing that something like racism can be broken to pieces only and only after you make sincere, compassionate efforts to share the world with others and discover that they are exactly like you. In Eastern philosophy, yes. in the Upanishads, mm. there is this discourse about the, the Brahman being in Atman. And Atman is nothing more than mm. recognizing the Brahman in you. And in that mm. differences of all kinds, gender differences, race differences, class differences, so forth and so on, begin to disappear once Brahman is an Atman, and Atman is in mm. Brahman, and the mm. self is just that. Mm. It is a self that belongs nowhere, because it is everywhere. And I see this development mm. in my own students. Mm. So after the semester is over, I must tell you the hugs Mm. The recognitions that I get mm. bring me close to tears. Mm. But then, there is the news media now <laughs> mm. that I have to fight yes. against. After yes. all the work is done, yes. then my students have to go back to the music industry again. Yes. To fight capitalist wars, wars of careers, guaranteeing positions, earning income and all this philosophical work yes. that is done in the classroom yes. begins to vanish. And that is tragic. This is my experience, Janet. I'm humbled. What you have described from my perspective is a transformative experience. You give your students the opportunity to experience themselves differently. Yes. I don't believe that ever vanishes. I hope not. I remember my transformative experiences. I embrace the future transformations awaiting me. And it is the very, very generous and hard work that you, as a dark-skinned man in a racist country, are forced to bear the burden of. You transform it into something beautiful. What you have described is beautiful. I thank you. But that it is your burden, that you must humanize yourself for your students, that must be exhausting. Very much so. The semester begins anew. I know. Hundreds of students again, and they have to travel the journey. Yes. Start all over again. I have to close my eyes. We have four minutes left. I have spoken so much for the first time as an interviewer because you stimulated me so much. I, please forgive me. And now we have about the three minutes that I would like you to use in any way you want. And I will not say a word. I thank you very much for the dialogue. 
when I'm talking, I don't learn very much. When I'm listening, I learn much more. I deeply appreciate that this has been a dialogue, that I have had the opportunity to learn from you. Thank you. You started by, uh, in both interviews, mentioning my last name and your fondness for it. Very much so. Schwalabag. It means, thank God. Praise the Lord. Amazing. I sometimes think, phew. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Tedros Kiros. I do not know the history of your last name, but I know Kiros in Greek is the Lord. Yes. Both of our names point to the sacred. Amazing. Share the sacred. And so despite what we may look like, what our training may be, where we grew up, the languages we speak, as you said, we share. There is something common in us. Very much so. I sensed that uh, the first time we began sharing an office together. And as you said, I think in my experience of Eastern philosophy, it has been primarily in Buddhism and Vipassana Buddhism. And it is the Buddha that lives in each one of us. Yes. And so I honor the Buddha in you. I thank you. Hmm. Thank you so much. Well, I must say in my eighth years, of interviewing. This has been one of the most memorable gems mm. and I would like my viewers to know that. This has been a host, Theodros Kiros for Afghan Ascent. Thank you so much.